The ongoing series, Water Crisis in the West, Thinking Like a Watershed, continues next Thursday at 7 p.m. at the Chemo Theater in Albuquerque with a discussion on rural issues such as ranching and farming. Correspondent Tara Gatewood sat down with last month's panelists who focused on indigenous perspectives regarding water. They explored how culture and closer ties to the natural environment foster respect for natural resources rather than a desire to control or alter them. I want to welcome you all to New Mexico In Focus. With me, I have Rena Swenzel from Santa Clara Pueblo, and she holds a doctorate in American Studies and writes and lectures on the philosophical and cultural basis of the Pueblo world. Uh, also with us is Juan Esteban Arellano, and he is a journalist, writer, and researcher who lives in Embudo, New Mexico. Also with us, we have Lyle Balenqua. He is Hopi and a member of the Greasewood Clan from Third Mesa, and he has degrees in cultural anthropology and archaeology. All of you ha had a chance to, to connect with uh, more folks from New Mexico um, at the Chemo Theater last night at a panel discussion. And, and all of you uh, touched on the important idea um, about this concept of conforming to the land rather than making it uh, conform to us. And so I want to hear, you know, how does this play out uh, in your communities uh, versus how we are facing an evolved uh, mainstream society? What do you think about that? Um, Esteban, let's start with you. Well, I think in our communities, you know, we, de <clears throat> we depend a lot on the, on the acequias. And uh, the acequias have been here for a long time and they have a, a long history. And uh, one of the things that, I'm, that I've seen is that we, as we forget that knowledge about how to maintain them and how to use uh, the, the little waters that sometimes we get through in the acequias, we have to find a way of adapting the little uh, water that we have to serve the, the purposes of, of growing food. And uh, before I think people knew really how to take care of the water now, we see a lot of times that people just turn on the, the head gate and go to Española or go to Taos. And before you know it, you see the, the water just running down, down into, the, into the road or into the arroyo. And that's not taking care of a limited resource. So in terms of uh, being able to, to conform, we have to adapt to, the, uh, to what we have. You know, that's why I mentioned last night that water has a memory we tend to forget that water has a memory. And, and to me, that's, that's very important, that we always take it in. And, uh, and also, water has a certain inherent wisdom, the same as the land has a knowledge and, and a wisdom that if we pay attention to it, we'll be able to, to hear it, and they'll be able to dictate and guide us to where we need to be going with uh, little uh, limited resources that we have. All right, and Rena, for you, when you put it in, in perspective of maybe your own community, this, this concept of um, you know, conforming to the land versus making it conform to us, uh, what are your thoughts on that? We are so essentially, I mean, every, every part of us is so connected to the land from our, our stories about where we came, how we, how we came out of the earth, we were born of the earth. I mean, that's a pretty essential idea, you know. If we're born, uh, if we're born, <laughs> we come out of the earth. We're born of the earth. We are as much her as we are anything we can ever be. And to maintain that relationship is really essential in Pueblo thought. How do we continue, you know, to have that relationship with the sky, the clouds, the mountains around us that give us a sense of place. Uh, it's, it's an ongoing thing. That's what the, all the dances, prayers are about in that world, as Lyle was saying. And, and I'd like to follow up. Um, what about when it is you know, put right face to face with what some people would say a modern world um, that says you can make the world conform to you. What do you think about that side of things? I think it's an impossibility, and I think what, that's where the fallacy of modern world is, is that is the thought that we are separate from the earth, from the land that we live on. That's just an impossibility for humans because we are a part of the earth, the land. Lyle, what would you like to add? 
Um, you know, I, I, I once asked this question about why we as Hopi people uh, ended up where we ended up at, given that in our ancestral past we once inhabited regions that were well watered, had a lot of water, rivers, streams, lakes. And the answer I was given was, you know, ultimately that it was through hardship of, of having less water that we would come to understand the preciousness of having that resource. And so for Hopi people, I think it's, we are who we are because of where we are, you know, and, and what that really translates to is understanding the limitations or the availability of the landscape that you inhabit and working within those boundaries, so to speak, uh, to understand how much you can push it, how much you can get from it, uh, what you need to do as a person to maintain that balance. So I think that this idea of trying to conform the landscape to our needs, in the archaeological record we see that that has failed many, many times for many cultures around the world. But here in the Southwest there's uh, numerous examples of great civilizations that have flourished and then for whatever reason, partly due to uh, depletion of resources and things like that, have collapsed and forced the people. It was a sign that um, that way of living wasn't the correct way. And so we needed to move on and reestablish ourselves and realign our values so that we continue the practice of learning how to live within our means. And so that's been the lesson, I think, for a lot of Pueblo people here over the generations is looking back at our past, seeing where our ancestors have failed to live up to these stewardship values of maintaining a balance and then trying to carry that lesson forward into the future so that we don't repeat that. So when we do consider, you know, our, our whole community, um, what would you say are the biggest challenges uh, facing your communities regarding water, you know, today? Arena, can you start us off? Water, water is just absolutely essential to, to any community, community, not just in, indigenous communities. And I think the Pueblo communities today, um, you know, talk about how the water is not as clean as it used to be, is not as uh, fresh even as it used to be. We find all sorts of, especially up north in the northern uh, communities around Los Alamos, so much pollutants uh, and just people throwing trash in the water, people not regarding it with respect. And I, and um, you know, just communities uh, not losing their sense of, of uh, oneness with the water, the, the river that runs through our communities. You know, people talk about when there used to be all sorts of different kinds of fish, birds, uh, different plants that were along the river. They're not there today anymore. And what does that mean? Is, that, is the river dying? And as, as it dies, I think our communities are in, in great trouble. Uh, it's not just a lack of what we call water, but it's a lack of, of the kind of the the kind of water that we have. And Rena, I know um, recently um, the issue challenges with water was more water than uh, normal, and your community faced a lot of issues with floods. You know, yes. what kind of challenges? I'd like to hear more the type of challenges uh, that it presented for the community. I th I think one of the big ones in in the whole flooding disaster that we had at Santa Clara. Was, was really a sense of how to allow the river also to speak, or the creek. We have a little creek that was, that was just inundated by the flood that came down from the mountains because there was no plant life to hold it back. And now it's in a gully, you know, it's in a six, 10 foot gully. Um, it's, it's just a, a way of, I think humans always try, whether they're native or not, always trying to control what the water does. 
And that's been, I think, a big issue even for Native communities is how do we allow the other to be what it is? Mm -hmm. And not just humans, but water to be what it is. Uh, and not try and dam it up and control it all, always. It's always about having control. All right, and Lyle, when it comes to challenges, what are your thoughts? Right now at Hopi, we, we have a few issues that we're dealing with. One is which um, the, the, the quality of the water. Um, we sit atop uh, the N aquifer out there on Black Mesa, which is uh, contains some of the most pristine water that can be found anywhere in the world. Um, hydrologists have looked at it and dated anywhere between 10 to 30,000 years old in terms of its glacial water that has accumulated over this period of time. Um, so that has been our sole source of drinking water for many, many generations. Um, there's numerous aquifers there, but the N aquifer is the purest and provides the cleanest water to date. However, now we're dealing, we're finding that uh, there's some contaminants within the water. Um, vanadium, uh, selenium, and arsenic are now being found in higher concentrations within the water that is uh, being utilized by the public. And so, what does that really mean? What is the, the cause of these uh, contaminants being uh, found in higher concentrations? Some of it is partly due or, or thought to be related to uh, the underground pumping of groundwater from Peabody Coal Mine, which is located just north of the Hopi Reservation, and the impact that the withdrawal that that has for those operations uh, on the, the availability and quality of the water that Hopi has relied on for so many years. And so that's a big issue in terms of how that operation which is 50 to 60 miles north of Hopi now, the communities, the villages, how that is impacting our quality of water that is now available. Uh, the Indian Health Service is now getting involved along with the Hopi tribe to find methods to uh, purify the water, but those also involve adding other chemicals to the water to, to um, abate the, the arsenic and other chemicals that are found. So are we truly rectifying the situation by adding these chemicals or in the long term are the addition of these other chemicals going to have some other long-term health effect for Hopi people. Um, that remains to be seen right now. So right now a big issue for, for those of us out at Hopi is how do we maintain the quality of our water which we have relied on for so many generations but also improve the infrastructure uh, that you know, delivers the water to the homes and, and the communities out there. Many, much of the infrastructure is well over 50 years old. It breaks down. Um, when it breaks down, you know, people don't have access to clean water. Um, and so we're, we're dealing with those issues right now in terms of trying to upgrade the system so that we can meet health codes uh, set forth by the federal government, the state, and the Hopi tribe, but also how do we keep those in line with maintaining our spiritual values to the water and so finding that balance right now um, is, is the challenge that we're facing. There's a lot to consider. And, you know, talking about thinking how this will uh, affect folks down the road, you know, it quickly gets me to thinking of our future generations. And uh, there's a lot of great knowledge here at the table with me today. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts as well about how do we instill th this type of thinking or um, the thought of, the land being sacred in the younger generation. Esteban, what do you think? I think that's one of the biggest challenges we're having now, you know, is to get, the, especially in our community, uh, to get the, the youth more involved. Because what we're seeing is that most of them, once they get out of high school, either they leave to go uh, work or go to college and they don't return. So, one of the challenges we're facing in our community is that we're becoming a, an old community. There's very few young people that are left or that are returning. And I think the, the way to teach them is to start them since very young and to involve them with what you're doing at, at home, you know, planting a, a small garden, 
have the kids uh, do the garden. Uh, now uh, a lot of the the youth have no idea where the food is coming from, and the same where the water is coming from because all they have to do is turn on the the faucet and water's there. But what if you turn on the faucet and there's nothing there, and it's going to happen one of these days? Yeah, there's a lot that that's connected, and it's great to bring focus to this. And Rena, your thoughts about, you know, where does it begin to, to instill this understanding of the sacredness of the relationship? I think, of course, it has to begin in the communities. And <coughs> our, our communities, in a, in a sense, right now are, are, are breaking down because of population growth. I mean, population growth is such a huge issue, not just for, and not just for indigenous communities, but for the world at large. I think the population is one of our mo main concerns. And what is happening in Pueblo communities is that the, the family that used to be the carrier of information, the, the older generation, and, and uh, the generations that follow, there's not a, a strong a continuity as there used to be. When you've got a small community, of course, uh, you know, the, the discussions, just the lifestyle, just the way one does something is followed from one generation to the next. When you have uh, children going to school all day long, even that breaks up a sense of, of community. There isn't contact with the grandparents who know the, all the, the traditional stories that that have the values of respect and care and belonging to a place. All right, and Lyle, we'd like to hear your, your thoughts as well. You know, some might even say you're a bridge in this conversation um, <clears throat> between the generations. Um, any thoughts uh, that you'd like to add? I, just to echo, you know, what, what my two colleagues have said about, it, it needs to start early with, with uh, the younger generations maintaining uh, a physical relationship with with the environment getting them out there into the landscape uh, at an early age so that they understand you know um, their place within that whole system learning where the water comes from where it goes how we get our food uh, the process that it takes to make that all happen I think is lost a lot because like Estevan was saying, we can turn on the faucet, we can go to the grocery store, we can go to a restaurant, and that's all pre-made for us, and it's readily available. Whereas 100 years ago, that wasn't the case, and so it, it took a lot more effort for our people to survive. And I think that, that understanding is, is what is slowly being lost over the generations, is that what does it actually take to sustain a person uh, and a family and keep that together and keep it going? So I think getting the younger generations out back into the landscape. There, I think there are some avenues that we can utilize technology to support that idea, but you know, modern technology has a place to a certain degree. Um, but it's really about getting back out there and getting your hands dirty, uh, playing in the water, uh, growing a garden, understanding that whole process so that you, you aren't so disconnected from it when you get to an older age. All right, I'd like to thank all of you for, for sharing with us today here and we appreciate uh, your words and thoughts on this. Thank you.